What if we can't cure diabetes? What if we can't cure diabetes? Or don't learn from our past? What if we never treat each other as equals? What if we can't make our city sustainable? Or solve the climate crisis? But what if we can? Because together, we have the potential. The potential. To shape a different future. A different future. Um, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are joining us from. My name is Sunera Tobani. I'm a professor in the Department of Asian Studies at the University of British Columbia. As the moderator for today's event, it is my very great pleasure to welcome you all to the first UBC Connects Masterclass of 2022 with author and scholar, Dr. Gurminder K. Bambra. We begin our program with acknowledging that UBC's campuses at Point Grey, Robson Square, and in the Okanagan are situated on the traditional unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh, and in the territory of the Silex Okanagan Nation. I would like to acknowledge that you are joining us today from many places near and far, and acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. I would now like to introduce President and Vice Chancellor of the University of British Columbia, Santa Ono. Dr. Ono is the 15th President and Vice Chancellor of the University of British Columbia. He will offer some opening remarks. Over to President Ono. Welcome to the UBC Connects Masterclass, the first of 2022. This event is being held in partnership with the second annual Racial Injustice Lecture and is presented by the UBC Department of Anthropology and Sociology. Professor Germinder Bambra will also be speaking virtually at a lecture on Friday, January 28th from 12.30 to 2 on her most recent co-authored book, Colonialism and Modern Social Theory, Decolonizing and Absence. I'd like to thank Sunera Thombani from UBC's Department of Asian Studies for moderating today's event. I'd also like to thank our student participants. And now a few words about our honored guest, Gurminder Bambra. She is a professor of post-colonial and decolonial studies at the University of Sussex, a fellow of the British Academy and president of the British Sociological Association. She is the author of Connected Sociologies, the award-winning Rethinking Modernity, Postcolonialism, and the Sociological Imagination, and the co-author of Colonialism and Modern Social Theory. She is also the co-editor of Decolonizing the University and runs the Global Social Theory site. She edits Discover Society and directs the Connected Sociologies Curriculum Project. Professor Bambra, welcome to the University of British Columbia Connects series. We are honored to have you with us. President Ono, we are very pleased that over 500 of you have joined us live for this session. I hope that the questions many of you have in your minds or have sent in advance will become part of today's conversation. They will be covered in the conversation. Today's masterclass is being recorded. It will be available to view on the UBC Connects webpage shortly after the event. Over the next hour, alongside with students from UBC's departments of anthropology and sociology, we will participate in a discussion with Dr. Gurminder Bhamra about her work. Dr. Bamra, thank you so very much for taking the time to be with us today. I now invite you to make some overall comments about the work you would like to share with us this morning before we move to the discussion by posing the students' questions to you. <laughs> 
Welcome, Dr. Bamra. Thank you so much for inviting me to participate in the masterclass. I really look forward to our conversations. Just to give you a little bit of background about me first and then to talk about the themes of the research that we're going to be discussing. I'm Professor of Postcolonial and Decolonial Studies at the University of Sussex in the UK and probably one of the few uh, uh, scholars who engages with the work of postcolonial and decolonial uh, theorists across the social sciences. It's been much more something that's been the central part of the humanities and is now gaining increasing um, interest among social scientists as well. So my research interests more broadly are in thinking about the ways in which the experiences and claims of non-European others have been rendered invisible to the dominant narratives and analytical frameworks of social science. And my current projects focus on concerns with issues of epistemological justice, which I hope we'll discuss uh, over the course of today, and also with reparations and on the political economy of colonial relations. I'm interested in colonialism in a global context. And one of the things that I've just been working on has been looking at the ways in which colonial subjects in India, for example, were required to pay income tax to the British state when this was not a requirement for working class or middle class British people, and how this should change the way in which we understand the history and politics of the welfare state. I've also been quite active in writing general audience pieces on contemporary political issues and have written extensively on Brexit, that is the movement of the UK wishing to leave the European Union. I've also written on the crisis for refugees in Europe, and on the idea of decolonizing the university. So in my short comments here, I'll address the call to decolonize critical theory specifically, which is developed at greater length in the article that is the basis for this conversation. Calls to decolonize the university and to decolonize curricula are circulating around much of the world. And they've been taken up as a provocation by colleagues who've been interested in interrogating what we might see as the Euro-centered understandings at the heart of academic knowledge. In the field of critical theory, for example, Amy Allen's book, The End of Progress, really seeks to take on this challenge and to demonstrate the ways in which Frankfurt School critical theory's reliance on Eurocentric understandings and to think about the ways in which it might be possible to decolonize critical theory. What I do in the article is consider the broader argument that's made by Amy Allen. And I ask, what would it actually mean to decolonize a tradition of thought? And in this case, it's Frankfurt School Critical Theory that has never explicitly acknowledged colonialism or colonial histories. Rather than decolonizing this theory, I suggest that it's more productive for it to engage substantively with the histories of colonialism and enslavement that are the context for the emergence of its foundations, and then try to reconstruct its conceptual categories and normative claims through this engagement. What is needed, I argue, is a consideration of the implications of this idea of the colonial modern, that is, an acknowledgement of the colonial constitution of modernity. And this is what I call in the article, an issue of epistemological justice. So what does that mean? Briefly, it involves questioning the adequacy of the grand narratives that structure the context within which we've come to understand ourselves and others. And it's this which shapes the possibilities of who has the power and why to assert their knowledge against the indications of its problematic status deriving from the different knowledge claims of others. So in a sense, what I'm putting forward is that for epistemological justice, what is needed is an address of the ways in which colonization and slavery and indenture were integral to the Enlightenment project of modernity, structuring both its knowledge claims and its institutions, but have largely been rendered invisible to it. As many historians argue, there's a sense that we have to admire the idea of the modern enterprise and the modern world, 
and as some argue, to treat the human adventure on Earth as an amazing success story, despite all the suffering entails. But whether we all have to celebrate the successes of some, despite the suffering of others, is what forms the core of post-colonial and other criticisms. Post-colonial and decolonial theories are based on trying to understand modernity as constituted by colonialism, such that modernity does not emerge or the modern world doesn't emerge from ideas of rupture or separation or revolution, but rather through the connected and entangled histories of European colonization. So the standard accounts of the modern world always orient to the French and industrial revolutions. But I would suggest that colonization, dispossession, enslavement, indenture, appropriation, including other revolutions such as the Haitian revolution and what is known as the Indian mutiny are also significant for how we understand how the modern world has come into being. And this is important to recognize because this broader context enables us to see that progress and progress as it's commonly understood is primarily in and for Europe has come at the cost of the lives and livelihoods of others. And so in this way, post-colonial and decolonial thought in the way that I engage with it is not something that simply seeks to disrupt knowledge claims, but actually looks to recognize and repair the fractures that have been created within our world by these earlier systems of thought and their associated practices. As Anthony Bogus argues, it's an interesting argument that suggests that progress has occurred and that emancipation and freedom are possible without having to take into account the debasement of humanity that occurs while practicing coercive power over people who've been enslaved, indentured and colonized. And so in this context, the past and its problems are better approached, I would suggest, through an understanding of reparations rather than progress. What reparations enables us to do is to think about the ways in which those who were previously dominant and those who continue to benefit from the structures of domination can come to understand the injustice of that domination and how it continues to structure the present. Now, the injustices of the past can't be repaired in the sense that that suffering could be undone or the past restored. But the argument for reparations is not an argument for a return to somewhere. It's an argument for how we might organize questions of justice for the future. It's an argument about how current inequalities within distribution are placed beyond the possibility of justice by virtue of being represented as historical. So this is why I say that reparation is epistemological insofar as it requires us to transform our understandings. And it's also practical in that it requires a redistribution of resources to address the inequalities that we inherit from the past. In this way, I would take issue with the idea of modernity being an unfinished project which is the dominant way of framing it by Habermas and others associated with the Frankfurt School of Critical Theory, but rather following Nelson Maldonado Torres argue that it's the project of decolonization that is unfinished. And this is what any properly critical theory must address. So the issue is, and I'll finish with this, less to decolonize theory and more that theorists should take colonial history seriously in their understandings of the modern world, because it's only by working together to address the inequalities that come out of our shared past that space comes to be opened up for the possibility of a future that's different from the present. Thank you so much, Dr. Bamra, for your comments. Uh, the transformation of Western traditions that you are calling for, that your work is calling for, is well overdue. 
And we certainly are living through a moment of global upheaval, global crisis. And you know, the kind of work, the kind of scholarship, the commitment to epistemological justice and reparations that one finds in your work is something that's really welcome. And I just want to say how much I've appreciated um, learning from your work and engaging with it. Um, I will now uh, turn to introducing the students who will be asking you specific questions that they are interested in bringing into the discussion. It's my very great pleasure to now welcome our student participants. I will call on you one by one and ask you to please introduce yourselves before we turn to your questions. So Theodora Roston Ekman, could you please introduce yourself? Hello, my name is Theodora. Um, I am a third year student of sociology and I'm really grateful to be part of this masterclass. It's a huge privilege to be talking with you all. Thank you. Um, Brian, Brian Leung, could you kindly introduce yourself? Hi there, everybody. My name is Brian Leung. I'm a fourth year sociology student at the University of British Columbia. Thank you. And McKenna Zimmerman, would you like to please introduce yourself? Um, yes. Hello, everyone. My name is McKenna. I am a fourth year honor sociology student, and I am very honored to be here with you all today. Thank you. Um, so I will now turn to Theodora and ask you to please present your first question to Dr. Bambra. Mm -hmm. So my first question regards um, your call for the need to re profoundly restructure social theory in order to interrelatedly achieve epistemological and practical justice. You teach us through our work that reparation means understanding histories of colonialism and domination in their structuring of the present. And from this understanding, formulating truly inclusive and collective equity. And you give the example that really interested me of the Caribbean community as a realization of this collective and inclusive equity and its possibility. So my question takes this framework and asks, how would you propose that social theorists, sociology students, and this profoundly restructured and epistemologically just social theory that is in creation need to be involved in criticizing, intervening, and changing neocolonial relations between settler colonial governments within settler colonial societies and indigenous nations. And I'm considering, of course, here in Canada and of course in other, in other settler colonial societies as well. Okay, hey, thank you so much for that question. I mean, it's a really complicated question. You've got a lot in there. I think perhaps the first thing I'll say in response to this is that when we think about the issue of reparations, we often think about the fact that it's not possible. How could we possibly repay that amount of money that would be needed to, um, to, to even begin to address the wrongs that have, have happened, the forms of possession that have happened, and, and so on? And then some might also argue that it's not really part of our traditions. We don't do reparations really, you know, we just need to move on, forget about the past and, and, and so on. The first response that I would have to that is that actually that's not quite true because within the European tradition and in a way the settler colonial context is an extension of the European tradition given that it was largely Europeans who were participating in those initial movements of, of dispossession and, and appropriation. And so I'm including European descended North Americans and South Americans in the, the, the frame when I talk about European social theory is that the idea to be compensated for loss of property is something that's central to enlightenment thought. If you have property and you lose it, you have to be compensated for it. And one of the most sort of stark examples of that was in the context of abolition within Britain, for example, the abolition of slavery that happened, compensation was paid to those who owned other people 
because those other people, as enslaved, were understood as their property. And if, as their property, they were now being freed, they were lost to the people who had owned them. And so, and so comp they called it compensation, but you could also see it as reparation had to be paid. A significant amount of money was paid, and through work that's been done by Catherine Hall and Richard Draper and others, they've calculated that the amount of money that was given by the British government to slave owners in Britain was the equivalent of around 20 to 30% of GDP at that time. So it was a vast amount. Of course, nothing was given to those who had been enslaved. There was no recognition of their loss of property in themselves, but there was recognition of the loss of property elsewhere. And so that's just partly to say that this question of reparations should be understood within the terms that already exist within European social theory. Like there are moments where it has happened and we can use that to argue for how it might need to happen again. Then I would just say that the one thing that's distinct from the arguments for reparations made by CARICOM and other communities who had been colonized, who are asking or demanding reparations, is that they're calling for collective reparations, not individual reparations. So what happened after the abolition of slavery was that individual slave owners were given X amount of money, you know, significant sums of money. What CARICOM are asking for is what I would call social democratic reparations. They're making the argument that as a consequence of enslavement, colonization, dispossession, the wealth that was generated by their ancestors in these islands was all appropriated and taken back to Britain to build the health service eventually, the roads, the social infrastructure institutions, et cetera. And none of that money was available to build these sorts of things within the Caribbean. And so the money is being asked not as compensation for what happened, but as reparations in order to build institutions for everybody who lives there to enjoy. And so I think in that sense, this issue of how these things need to be negotiated have to be negotiated by those people who are located in those territories, in those political struggles and in those movements. So just to come to the last thing, because you're asking me about settler colonialism and the relationship with indigenous nations, I would say this, and that's, and, and here I sort of follow the work of Erna Brodber. She's a Jamaican sociologist, also a novelist, a, a fantastic scholar and thinker. And one of the things that she said in, in a sort of, um, when I was sharing space with her was that you have to dig where you are. Like you have to do the work where you are. I'm in Britain, the work that I do and the research that I do is focused on thinking about the histories of British colonialism, which include the settler context as well, although that develops in a particular sort of way, and thinking about how those histories have an impact on the shaping of society and the state within Britain. And I'm invested in those arguments here, and I know how I would intervene in them here, but I wouldn't want to say, and this is how you must do it in that context, because I'm sure there are nuances, there are complexities that are just not available or apparent to me in terms of what that conversation needs to be. But there are people who are doing this. And so in that sense, I would just say that the things that we need to do are read, listen and learn. Thank you so much for that response. I learned a lot from that. Thank you. Thank you, Theodora and Professor Bambara for your answer. Um, I'll now turn to Brian. Brian, would you like to pose your first question? Yes, thank you. First and foremost, thank you for taking the time to talk with us, Dr. Bambara. My first question to you today revolves around how decolonial and post-colonial critique and theory can move towards being more integrating and guiding public social policy from just being a more niche critique used by academics. 
The reason for this question is that critics like film and media studies professor Kathleen Liu might say that these theoretical views or language tend to obfuscate from real world issues, resulting in resources being spent on arguing about rhetoric amongst the professional managerial class rather than crafting policy to truly transform the lives we purport to represent with these theories. Thank you. Thanks for that question as well. I completely agree that the point of theory should be for some purpose that is manifest within the world. And in that sense, I think it's important to think about what it is that you wish to use theory for. For me, post-colonial and decolonial theoretical understandings and interventions are much more about the sorts of questions that they're seeking to answer and how we can mobilize those insights for other projects that we might be interested in. So what do I mean by that? Partly that there's, there can sometimes be academic disagreement about whether we should use the term post-colonial or decolonial. And more recently, there's also been a thing of maybe we should use neither and move to anti-colonial and so on. And my response to this is partly that this is academic entrepreneurship. It's about carving out niches and distinctive spaces. And it's not clear to me that there is anything that is radically different between the different perspectives. There are nuances, there are complexities, but ultimately people who are invested in thinking about the post-colonial or the decolonial and the anti-colonial are interested in thinking about A, the history of colonialism within the world, the impact that has made on societies and states, and what resources might be available to us if we mobilize these theoretical traditions to think about how the world might need to be reshaped as a consequence of those legacies. So for me, I would say that I use the term post-colonial as a sort of theoretical provocation to always consider the colonial in whatever it is that I'm investigating or researching. And that is partly because I don't think that there's any aspect of the modern world within which we live that isn't shaped and determined by 500 years of European colonization. Because in a sense, the very construction of the world as a global space and the idea of it as modern is intimately tied to the coloniality through which it comes into being. And yet so much of the work that we do, particularly in the social sciences, tries to understand the world as if it was just modern and without thinking of those colonial histories. And I would argue that actually we always need to think about those colonial histories when we're thinking about contemporary social issues. And so in that sense, what impact that would have for public policy would come out of, well, what are the questions that we're wanting to answer? Do the, do the current um, concepts and categories that we use enable us to answer these adequately? Or actually, do we need to take a step back, have a broader view, and then rethink how we might need to reshape the tools that we have through our disciplines in order to more effectively intervene in addressing those problems. Thank you. Thank you both very much. We'll now turn to our third question, which will be posed by McKenna. McKenna, would you like to please now take the stage? Yes, um, and hello, Dr. Bombra. Again, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Um, so my question is about how a lot of the time, it falls upon the shoulders of people of color, and more specifically women of color, to lead the work that needs to be done to actually deconstruct and dismantle social issues. Um, and as the topics that we're discussing today impact all of us in different ways and expand far beyond academia, I'm wondering who you think needs to lead the work of decolonization. Um, because when it comes time to begin and really engage with the uh, radical and progressive work that is needed to dismantle and change the status quo, it can sometimes feel like the people who need that change the most 
um, can be left on their own. Like, this is your problem, so you go fix it. And of course, I do think that the people who possess the most agency need to be absolutely central in the deconstruction of the forces that oppress them. But I don't think they should be left to fend for themselves. Um, so taking that into account, uh, who do you want to see at the helm of decolonization? And who do you want to see lead the charge? Well, I think um, instead of thinking about it in terms of who's going to lead it or who's going to be at the helm of it, I'd rather think about it in terms that, that in a sense, I think actually motivate the question about the collaborations that are necessary for us to be able to do this work. There are no problems in the world that are owned by any individuals or any individual groups. The problems that exist in the world exist between us, whether they exist between us as individuals or again exist between us as groups or as populations. And so if the problems are not in us, but are between us, then that means that both those who perhaps generate the problems and those who are at the effect of the problems are affected by the problems, albeit in different ways. So there's a hierarchy of the way in which those who generate problems are affected by them versus those who are at the effect of those problems. But without all groups coming to understand that they're invested in both the production of the problems, they're not going to be able to resolve those problems because they can't be resolved by any uh, group on their own. And I think sometimes when teaching this work or doing this work. One of the examples that I sometimes use, and this has often been when teaching philosophy of social science, for example, is to talk about the fact that as a feminist, I'm not a feminist because I wish to forever be a feminist. I'm a feminist because I think that there are issues in the ways in which the relations between the genders are organized that are problematic. And those problems exist in the way in which we understand and, and have traditionally understood the roles of particular genders and the ways in which these are put into hierarchical forms and so on. Those hierarchies affect all of us. There's ways in which they both generate advantages for those who could be seen to benefit from, let's call it patriarchy, and also those who don't benefit from it. And so I, accept, I expect everybody to be a feminist if they're interested in resolving the issues that emerge as problematic through the hierarchies of the ways in which we understand the relationship between genders. And in the same way, I would expect everybody to be an anti-racist or interested in addressing the problems that have been produced by colonialism within the world, because there's no way that we're going to address any of these problems unless we work together to address them. Thank you very much. Thank um, you very much. Thank you, McKenna. And also thank you, Dr. Bambara. Before we go to the second round of questions from the students, I would like to push you a little bit on some of the points you're making. Uh, so, you know, the kind of use of post-colonial theory uh, is of course, extremely necessary, critical uh, in doing any kind of critical anti-colonial work in the present. But post-colonial theory itself is contested from within. Um, the same could be said about feminist theory, deeply contested area. Um, so, you know, when, when we talk about drawing on these theoretical uh, traditions, I think it's really crucial to pay attention to exactly which traditions within these larger traditions we are uh, kind of discussing. So I just like to push you a little bit on that, um, mm -hmm. but I will turn to the students now for their uh, second uh, round of questions. So Theodora, would you like to pose your second question, please? Yes, thank you. Um, so something that really caught my attention in your discussion of the severe limitations of Frankfurt School critical theory is the misunderstanding of racism as only a cultural phenomenon rather than a social structure and a theory of society, and then interrelatedly as a matter to be treated exclusively through humanities, as you addressed in your introduction. And you point to Baum's understanding of post-colonial theory Bonds under that that understanding limits it to its expression in the humanities. 
as related to identity and representation, importantly, but without addressing its relation to social sciences and theory of society. So my question is, can you speak to how these different dynamics of post-colonial theory within these respective fields of humanities and social sciences, like interact and mutually inform. And then most importantly, as students and learners in and outside of academia, of course, how do we use this interrelation of the humanities and the social sciences for decolonization and reparation and liberation really? Okay, so thank you for the question. I think, I mean, here, and, and perhaps also to answer some of the, the points that Sonera brought forward in, in this uh, discussion, I would shift to the work of Kadri Ismail. I don't know if you know his work, but he wrote a brilliant article that I read a while ago called Exiting Europe, Exciting Europe. And one of the points that he draws out in his discussion of the difference between post-colonial and decolonial is that one of the things that decoloniality does is often devolve to a celebration of the subject. So it becomes about issues of subjectivity. And I think you also find that within sort of uh, forms of post-colonial studies within the humanities, particularly where there's a shift to the cultural, to the self, to questions of identity, representation. And these are all important questions. So I'm not wishing to say that this is not important work that needs to be done, but he makes a distinction between that that form of post-colonial theory, which is interested in thinking about issues in terms of epistemology, that is the politics of knowledge production. How is it that we have come to understand the world in which, in the way in which we understand it? And what difference could be made to not just our understandings, but our interventions in the world, if we were to understand it differently? And it's not differently for its own sake, but it's differently because it's more adequate. And what are the standards of adequacy by which we might make these judgments? And so in that sense, I would suggest that there's that, that I'm a sociologist. And as a sociologist, I'm interested in issues of structure and of inequality, and particularly socioeconomic inequality. I'm interested in knowing how those structures have come into being and how they're produced and reproduced, and how in their production and reproduction, they often map onto what are seen to be the visible differences of race. And I think here, what I would argue is that racism is something that's produced by colonialism. It's not something that pre-exists the colonial process because it, it's something that comes to be used as a means of justifying what Europeans are doing in the world and of making good what they know to be bad. So the very idea of progress, for example, if you think about when Europeans come to the lands that we now call the Americas, that the people they encounter there, they regard themselves not only to have traveled across space in their encounters with them, but they believe that they've gone back in time because they see the people they encounter as being their ancestors. So even though they're living at the same time as them, they frame them within their theories as being their ancestors. What does it mean to frame them as their ancestors? One thing is that if the Europeans are the future of these people, it doesn't matter if they die out or if they are made to die out because they were the past anyway. So the very idea of progress that is inbuilt within modern social science depends on a logic where some people are already deemed to be of the past and therefore their lives, their livelihoods, their understandings do not matter. I'm not interested, all, you know, so again, there's that aspect that it's important to think about cultural identities, forms of representation and all of that, but I also want to intervene in not having it be possible to organize our understandings so that we value people in those hierarchies that enable the sorts of things to happen, to happen. I want to make an intervention into that basic structure of knowledge 
and reveal the hierarchies that exist, not just celebrate the differences of how we're all different. And so I think in that sense, that's where I would see the divide between the humanities and the social sciences. And I'll probably get into a lot of trouble for sort of saying all this because it's, it's you know, we make our choices about what we study and what we do because we think that the things that we do are the most important. If we thought something else was more important, we'd be doing that. So as a sociologist, I can't but justify my own choices by framing these understandings in this way. But that's where I'm coming from. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you both very much. I'll now turn to Brian for his second question. Thank you. So my second question revolves around um, governments in the global north or west being uh, willing to implement decolonial theory or the lens of decolonial theory, given its proximity to critical theory. The reason I ask this is because the panic on the conservative right in the US around critical race theory um, could prove to be uh, problematic for governments being unwilling to implement these um, policies around uh, decolonial theory. So more broadly, how should we be steering the conversation if we want to implement these theoretical views into the general public? Thank you. Thanks for that. I mean, I think, I guess I would see the relationship differently. So I don't think that the theories that are produced within universities or within spaces of intellectual you know engagement and thought and consideration are straightforwardly transferable into thinking about the ways in which we govern and then the production of government policy but the way in which concepts are shaped and understood does come to change these other ideas and understandings and I guess one thing just to say before I continue is that I don't see universities as being the only places where knowledge, knowledge is produced, but they are important sites of the validation, legitimation and amplification of knowledge. So in that sense, it's when, you know, so if we think about the feminist movement, for example, that made arguments for gender justice, there were those movements existed outside of the space of, of the university and as women entered the university and began to sort of challenge the norms and understandings that led to particular valuations of women and women's place and, and so on, you began to then have a shift in the way in which policy was organised around thinking about the place of women and then thinking about the place of work and family and, and these other things. But there's not a direct sort of, you know, that you have a particular theory here and then you create a policy on the basis of it. I think the changes and we can, one of the most successful forms of, of that happening actually has been around sort of scholarship on the body. For example, in relation to thinking about disability and the way in which our built environment, for example, is not built for people who are differently abled in different sorts of ways. It's built for a very particular understanding of who we are. And so arguments and sociological work on the body specifically has opened up those questions of how we make buildings accessible, how we make our cities accessible for people to be able to use, not just if they're differently abled in terms of sort of physical differences, but also thinking about issues as we age, how do we make, you know, and, and so on. So I think it's that sense of the work that happens has to be translated into how would this make sense once we take it into the world beyond the university. But that should be our orientation, you know. So I don't think about knowledge for its own sake. I think that the knowledge we produce has to be for some purpose. Thank you. Thank you both very much. And now I'll invite McKenna to please present your second question for Dr. Bambara. Yes, hello. Um, so you wrote that um, on page 79, that the modern social or modernity is seen to be constituted as the outcome of endogenous processes of European history, and that the rest of the world is presented as outside these world historical processes. And furthermore, colonial connections are seen as insignificant to their development. 
So how do we educate and work towards not viewing modernity as this end of evolution? Because this is certainly how people in Canada, the United States, and across Europe, and in many places around the world view themselves as kind of static and as this modern nation that has completed development. And this topic in particular really reminded me of Durkheim, who is one of the founding fathers of sociology, but wrote about primitivism and barbarity and morbidity and positioned himself and the Eurocentric, homogenous and heteronormative bodies around him as what is evolved and as having finished the process of development and embodies what all other cultures and people should be aspiring towards. Um, which is concerning. Um, so yes, I am wondering what you think the best ways will be to reimagine this understanding of modernity and re-educate the West and Europe and nations who understand themselves as modern to not see ourselves as modern or as having reached the final destination of evolution. So thank you so much for that. I mean, again, there's a lot in the question. I would perhaps just start with Durkheim briefly because I'm perhaps slightly more sympathetic to him than, than you've presented here. And in part because I've just done this uh, book with, with a colleague, John Homeward, Colonialism and Modern Social Theory, where we take each of the sort of key sociological founding figures, if you like, from Tocqueville, Marx, Weber, Durkheim and Du Bois and sort of think about their work in the context of their engagements with colonialism, because they all engage with colonialism, whether they recognize that or not in their writing and whether subsequent scholarship recognizes the colonial context as a whole other issue, which is partly what we're exploring. And I think Durkheim is sometimes misread and misrepresented because there's a distinction and we make this in the book that whereas for Locke in the beginning, all the world was America, so this idea that when Europeans came to these lands, the people they were encountering were the original inhabitants of the earth. And in that sense were, in European terms, our past and could be superseded. The ways in which Durkheim engages with others is in part to think about what it is that can be learnt from them. So for him, there's almost the sense that in the end, we are all Aboriginal. And in this sense, he's talking about Australian uh, indigenous peoples. And so it isn't so much that these people are seen as our past, but actually they're seen that in the end, we are all the same. And so his arguments about the modern are not, I think, similar to those of either Marx or Weber, and that there's a more sympathetic reading that that can be made of, of Durkheim. But shifting to your question about the way in which we understand the modern world, I mean, part of this the difficulty with this is that it's not just school or university that tells us that we here are modern and how it is that we've become modern. Everything tells us that. You think about the films you watch, the TV you watch, the music you listen to, you know, and, and this is something that um, the Haitian anthropologist Michel Rolf Truyo argues very strongly in his book, Silencing the Past, that our sense of the past is rarely given to us through academic scholarship and it's much more through the films we watch and so in that sense shifting those understandings is going to be a much bigger task than getting the story right here and so in that sense i would urge everybody who's listening or watching that if you've got the possibility of making films of doing sort of you know how do we get this knowledge out and reproduce it in a way that makes it make sense in a different sort of way? I mean, partly it will be that, I don't think we should be disheartened by this because if, if you know, the argument is correct that the world that has been brought into being has come into being as a consequence of 500 years of European colonization, then formal decolonization on a mass scale has only been going on for about the last hundred years. So there's quite a lot of work to undo, to remake and to rethink. And that work is going on and it is happening. And I mean, to the extent that when I first started um, talking about the Haitian revolution, for example, there would be very few people who even knew about the Haitian revolution or had any understanding of it. Now more people know about it even if it hasn't changed the way in which we understand questions of modernity or democracy, 
it's come into people's consciousness and they feel that they at least have to have some sense of it. And then the thing is to push them to sort of say, well, if you accept that the Haitian revolution is central to the making of the modern world, then that means we have to reconsider what it was that we had understood in relation to the French revolution. Because France was the colonial oppressor of Haiti. So you can't put the Haitian revolution alongside the French revolution, because what the Haitian revolution does is requires us to reconsider the French revolution, not as a revolution of democracy, but as a revolution of democracy for a specific population and the maintenance of hierarchical relations of domination against other populations. So the French version of equality has racial hierarchy at its heart. And yet it's presented as the abstract understanding or a universal understanding that should be used as the basis from which to decide whether others are equal or democratic or not. And so that work still needs to be done. Thank you so much. Thank you for the question, McKenna, and for your response, Dr. Bambra. I'm so sorry we're working you so hard that we are going to make the most of this time that we have with you. Uh, so if I might just make one comment before I turn to the next round of questions. And I'm really glad that you make the point that universities are not the only place where knowledge is produced. Uh, this is a very important point for academics to acknowledge and recognize. And of course, you know, uh, my own view is that we wouldn't be having conversations like these with the support of the highest administrative levels within universities without movement politics being what they are today. Um, so I think that, you know, uh, if we think about the conversations we're having around racial injustice in the university, we cannot even imagine them without the Black Lives Matter movement, without the you know, uh, anti-Islamophobia movements, without the indigenous resurgence, uh, indigenous politics of resistance, uh, the organizing around anti-Asian racism uh, that has taken place. So uh, this is really important to acknowledge, but it also posits a very dangerous moment for these movements because we are seeing universities respond and the response is inclusion. It's equity, diversity, inclusion, when you know, the demand is for racial justice and a transformation of institutions. So movement politics are very important. They produce forms of knowledge, but the danger of course is institutions appropriating them. Uh, so, you know, I, I would like to, at some point in this conversation, kind of, you know, ha uh, have your thoughts uh, on Can I respond that. now? Is that yes, please. Okay. Yes. yes. I mean, I, I so much agree with what you say. And I think perhaps the one point of disagreement is around the role of institutions. Mm -hmm. Because I think in, in across Europe, and certainly in your immediate neighbour to the south, there's a real danger and I don't know what the situation is like in Canada, it might also be similar for you, but here we're facing an absolute resurgence of authoritarian populism, xenophobic hostility, and shifts towards forms of politics that are arbitrary, mm -hmm. not governed by rules or procedures, and are at the whim of those who are in elected office. I mean, this is something that here in Britain, for example, we're facing absolutely, given that our prime minister has allegedly attended parties. You know, I mean, what do you call it? If you have a birthday cake, you sing happy birthday, you have party food, is that a party? Apparently it's a work event. Mm -hmm. And so this sort of shift, you know, so I think it's really imp important to maintain a sense of, better and worse institutions. So yes, institutions can be good and they can be not good. But the problem for me at least is not the institution, but the form that the institution is taking. Mm -hmm. And in the movement towards authoritarianism on the one hand, populism on the other, institutions I think are mid-level forms of organization that help us mediate between those forms of you know, A, dictatorship, B, populist dictatorship, and are really, really important to not give up on. 
I always accept we can make institutions better. Yes. Well, no, I, I agree with you. The moment we're in uh, right now makes institutions a very, very kind of fraught subject to think about because of course we have to depend on the institutions for the gains that have already been made. But institutions are also hugely, you know, uh, playing a very important role right now in, in mobilizing a sort of counter politics. Um, and uh, so the, the demand for accountability from, for, from institutions has to remain ongoing. And I agree with you on that completely. I don't want to take the spotlight away from the students, but I will ask you to be patient for a few minutes. There is one audience question that I would like to take because I don't think we're going to have much time for audience questions. So I'll ask the students for a little bit of patience. I'll come back to you for your third round of questions. But there is an audience question that asks you to comment on caste and colonialism. And the person who's written the question is making a reference to Isabel Wilkinson's new book, of course, uh, Race and Caste, um, where she's thinking through the relationship between race and caste. The book is called Caste. So I wonder if you could just respond to this particular question. This would take a lot longer than I think we would possibly have, in part because I think the way in which Wilkinson uses the term caste she uses it in a way that makes it so much more about status and thinking about the specific issue of African Americans in the US. And it's not really associated with thinking about caste as it emerges as a category of hierarchy and domination within the Indian subcontinent mm -hmm. context. And she's critical of the work of Oliver Cromwell Cox, who wrote this magnificent book, Class, Caste and Race, which I think is actually a much more solid sociological account mm -hmm. of issues of caste, class and race. And I think in part because he came, I think he came from Trinidad and was therefore engaged with the different populations where caste was, if you like, an organic category. Mm -hmm. And so his thinking, so his thinking on caste is is very likely shaped by that context. And so it gives us a different, um, way to think about the issues. I mean, the one thing that I would also want to say is that this work that I've been doing recently, looking at the extent to which Britain appropriated wealth from India, for example, you know, so there's work that's been done by Utsa Patnaik and others, all the way back to Dada by Naroji, Lala Lajpat Rai, who talk about colonial drain and, and so on. And Utsa Patnaik has also written about the ways in which specific policy moves that were made by the British government in the 1940s generated famine in Bengal and actually, you know, across the period of British rule generated famine. And then there is also the issue of who was impacted by famine in India. It was predominantly those who were at the bottom of the social hierarchies, and so on. And so the divisions that are created by colonialism between the colonizing country and the colonized country, there are also divisions within the colonized country in relation to caste in India, which I think we also need to take seriously and have perhaps been less remarked upon by scholars of Indian history and contemporary politics in, in that way. And I'm thinking here of obviously those that we know, for example, subaltern study school historians don't often regard caste as a significant category of hierarchy that needs to be interrogated in the way in which other scholars would think that it's actually vital that it needs to be done. So we need to, again, talk much more across those, those divisions and do work that takes us beyond the silos that we find ourselves in. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Theodora, I'll come back to you for your third and unfortunately it will have to be your last question. Thank you. Um, so, McKenna, I really appreciated that you brought up the discussion of the relationship between the education system and decolonization and postcolonial critique and this conversation about the relationship between institutions 
media movement politics and everything is really fascinating. I would like to pose a question that does again relate to the university specifically and your work on decolonizing the university and specifically conventional sociological curriculums and their perpetuation within post-secondary institutions um, using your framework of epistemological justice. And so basically my question is to what extent do you believe that conventional curriculums should and can be altered for the realization of epistemological justice? And then what is the role of students in advocating for this within our institutions? Okay, so I think this is a really important question in terms of thinking, because it's that sense that knowledge is produced in universities and reproduced. And how do we effect transformation in one of our core activities, which is teaching? It's hard. It's not easy to do. And in part because there's been, and I don't know if the situation is similar in Canada, I would imagine that it is, but in Britain, for example, we have increased numbers of colleagues who are appointed onto short-term contracts. And so you have increased precarity in terms of those who teach and who are doing that work. If you've only got a one-year contract, how much time are you going to invest in transforming the curriculum rather than just teaching what it is that you've been given because your view, you need to then think about where you're going to get your next job from in order to feed yourself and your family and, and so on. And so I think in that sense, the increasing precaritization of the university is an obstacle to doing the sort of work that is needed to do to transform the curriculum. I'll give you my own example. In my first job, and it was a permanent job, I was lucky, I, was, I started it a month before I was due to teach and I was asked to teach a course on modernity. I had just written my book, Rethinking Modernity, which argued against the standard presentation of modernity. The curriculum I got given, however, was about modernity as the French Revolution, the Industrial Revolution, isn't it a wonderful thing? And it's like, okay, I've got a month to go, I've got to start teaching, what do I do? And so I thought, well, what I could do is in the first half, I'll teach the standard curriculum. And in the second half, I'll teach the critique. That went fine, the classes were good. All the essays came in at the end saying, isn't modernity a wonderful thing? The Europeans gave it as a gift to the world. And it's like, well, that wasn't really quite what the course set out, but okay, let's try again. So next year, I thought, let's pair the topic. So we had the French Revolution with the Haitian Revolution. We had the Industrial Revolution with colonialism. We had, you know, and again, students were great in the seminars, discussed, got the critique, all the essays, isn't modernity a wonderful European invention? And that's when on reading Michelle Rolf Truyo's book, I realized that actually everything is telling them that modernity is European, you know? And so the, the extent of my revisions had just not been enough. And so then at one point I decided, okay, I'm going to start as if critique was the norm. Let's forget the standard presentation. I've done enough research. I know this to be rigorous, evidence-based, well thought through. Let's start with the making of the modern world as being produced through dispossession, elimination, appropriation, colonization, enslavement, and indenture. That was extraordinary. Then suddenly it was as if, you know, having cleared the space and given students these other concepts and themes and understandings, it gave them license to write essays on things that came out of the course, as opposed to just repeating what it was that they thought that they should be saying and so on. That took me three or four years to work out. That's not something that can just be done on a rolling contract or on zero hours contracts and, and so on. And so we have to recognize that the conditions of employment of faculty, researchers and students within the university is as central to the possibility of transforming the university as the intellectual work that we also want to do within the university. These things can't be separated. Thank you so, so much for that. Yeah, I really appreciate it. And I really appreciate hearing your personal perspective. Thank you both.
Um, I'll now turn to Brian. Thank you. So for my final question, I want to move away from policy to more contemporary public discourse. And we're going to go back in time. So you wrote in a New York Times op-ed in 2020 on the, uh, the removal of colonial statues in Britain. Um, do you think these removals have been what you have hoped for in terms of sparking discourse in decolonizing our institutions, given that these acts are reifications of the post-colonial lens for transformation? Or has the conversation just kind of veered off to people arguing about whether we should be removing these statues or keeping them up for what uh, some describe as perceived historical value? No, I mean, it, it's interesting that the debate that sort of often emerges around statues and whether we should have them, whether we should take them down and what we should do about them. And I think that, you know, so in one sense, the removal of the statue of Colston, which had been in Bristol in, in the UK, has led to many, many, many more people knowing who Colston was, knowing what he did, and the relationship of the slave trade to the establishment of wealth in Britain. So this is something that had never really been part of the public discourse and that particular act made it part of the public discourse. Then there have been arguments about other statues and what you do about them. My sense is, is that what matters is the work that is necessary to understand our past and to understand why we thought it was important to value some things and some people and whether who we are today are still the people who think that those things should be valued. So I think these moments always ought to be used as prompts to reflect on who we are and whether the spaces we inhabit represent who it is that we wish to represent ourselves as and have that be the focus rather than just get into, should this statue come down or that one, or who was worse or who, you know, those sorts of things, I think. Um, so yeah, so think of it as a teaching moment and a learning Perfect. moment as well. Yeah, for sure. Thank you for that response. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both very much. And McKenna, your last question. Okay, so this question is going in a bit of a different direction and was inspired by an audience question. Um, so the COVID-19 pandemic has um, affected us all in very different ways. Um, something that I have found really interesting is the very noticeable difference in access to vaccines across the world and how in uh, settler, settler colonial countries right now, you're able to get a booster shot, you know, a third vaccination at a pharmacy or a grocery store, while some other nations haven't even received the needed amount of a first dose to really make a difference, um, which you know is a very clear, clear gap that is certainly informed by the continued effects of colonialism. So this is a pretty open-ended question, but how should we go about decolonizing the pandemic? Well, again, I guess I would come back to the issue that we have to recognize how colonialism is central to the pandemic. Because if we think about, you know, so from thinking about the ways in which we have disparities in the outcomes of people who have caught COVID within, if you like, advanced countries versus also thinking about the disparities that exist between countries that have access to the vaccine and those that don't. Colonialism infuses both the internal dynamics of countries through the differential impact on racialized minorities, as well as having an impact on access to the vaccines between those countries and things like you know, patents and the refusal to waive patents and think about how we might be able to vaccinate the entire world if we were to sort of give up on this idea of owning of property rights within what is effectively knowledge that's produced through collective and collaborative endeavors and, and so on. And so in that sense, what would it mean to think of a decolonial pandemic is to think about what are the colonial relations that have shaped the pandemic so that it has the outcomes that it has and how in addressing those, would we open up the space for thinking about an equ a, a more equitable world that would enable us all to be able to live 
Thank you. Thank you for that last question, McKenna, and thank you for your response, uh, Dr. Bambra. Um, unfortunately, we're almost out of time. I'm so sorry. We could have had, you know, several more hours of discussion. Uh, but thank you very much to Theodora, Brian, and McKenna for being a part of this masterclass today and for, you know, posing such thoughtful and incisive uh, questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Bamra, for sharing your work. This has been such a terrific learning opportunity for all of us. Uh, personally, I'm just very, very grateful to you for taking the time to be with us today. Uh, to all of our audience members, Professor Bamra will be delivering the second racial, in sorry, the second annual racial injustice lecture on January 28th from 12.30 p.m. to 2 p.m. BC time. Um, you can register through the Department of Anthropology website at UBC. Um, look for the annual racial injustice lecture, colonialism and modern social theory. Um, I will remind you that registrations will close on Wednesday. Uh, so please register as soon as this class masterclass ends. Um, UBC Connects will also be emailing viewers a post-event survey at the conclusion of our program, and the team would certainly appreciate your feedback very much. Lastly, a tremendous thank you to the team at UBC for making this event possible, and to each of you for joining us virtually and for spending a part of your day with us. Have a wonderful day. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much for the invitation. It was great to be Thank part of this conversation and the students were magnificent. Thank you for your questions. They were really great. Thank you all very much. <laughs>